project and what's being done, what's upcoming. Uh, but the last time uh, that uh, Summit Construction uh, was here to present to the board, it was actually back at the end of October. So a lot's happened since then. Um, I asked um, the two project managers, Adam Hewer and Andy Rogers, to uh, come in and uh, they put a few things together and I just kind of wanted them to go over what's being done, what the next few months look, looks like as they uh, hope to wrap up the project going into the spring and early summer. And um, we got some photos and things, but they, in your, uh, on your desk, I also put this uh, project report that they put together. So I was gonna ask those two to come on up and go over that. And uh, got some pictures I could put up of the uh, inside of the building on the uh, display panel as well, so. Good yep, I'm good. Yeah, so what we wanted to do tonight was just put together a quick status report uh, for the board to kind of go over a couple things. Number one, what we're working on. Um, currently, what we have upcoming, some important milestone dates that are coming up. We want to quickly review um, the CMR contingency, where we stand with that, which, you know, as you guys know, that that's the, the pot of money that we kind of set aside the project, sets aside to deal with things, unforeseen things from a construction standpoint, kind of update the financial side of that, where we are. And, Kind of what we perceive, but just quick update on, on progress in the classroom wings. We're, we're deep into finishes now. I'm working on flooring, wall devices, ceiling tile, um, set of plumbing fixtures in the casework. So, all both classroom wings are really starting to come together, um, really start looking, you know, like a finished product, which is what we want as we kind of move to different areas of the building. Um, administration, um, first coat of paint, ceiling grid, air devices, pipe, and duct insulation. You know, we had to deal with that bump out of the administration that we had to work on um, after, but we're really catching that area up. I'm really happy about the progress that we're seeing there. Um, student dining and gym, which is really kind of the where we're working our way back to. I'm still putting a little bit of pipe insulation on, uh, first coat of paint, um, putting that stage soft in to conceal all the piping in front of the stage, and still kind of wrapping up some electrical conduit. Um, kitchen, again, it's overhead mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Um, we did get the cooler freezer installed there as well. Um, exterior, we got the three center supper in this week. Um, we're working on that courtyard learning wall, which is your outside student learning area. Working on that wall, it's getting that wrapped up. Still plugging the layer of metal roof panels. Obviously, this is the first week we've been back on that in the last three weeks. We just did not need to be remotely safe to be up there. Yeah. Um, and they are brick cleaning on the south side, so we started doing that. Um, upcoming work, you know, continuing the really flooring, final coat of paint, um, doors and hardware are coming, start putting up the wireless access points in the classroom wings, um, getting everything in the seals, done with the administration, um, and then really, you know, first coat of paint, drywall um, for that soffit, the stage ceiling, um, grid, gym light fixtures, really going to concentrate on that back, getting everybody moved back there, um, working in those areas, getting it wrapped up as we kind of start, you know, really getting the, putting the final touches on the classroom wings. Um, kitchen first coat of paint, ceiling good, right fixtures, and exterior. We are the only really difference is we're putting the tennis court grain, under grain bins here as well. So, um, key milestone dates: uh, permanent power. That means you know the power's going to be energized in the building. You're, we'll see lights burning, and that's going to happen tomorrow. What 9:30? I don't know yep. what they said. We need a ceremony. In mid-March, we're going to be um, doing a, a startup of the hot water mechanical system. That'll be the air handlers, the, the DOAS unit, and the boiler system. And what happens from there is we can temporarily use the system to heat, um, heat the building, move air throughout the building, which is needed for final finishes, um, but also get all the controls kind of worked out. Um, you get that all ironed out before the building gets turned over to you. So that allows our controls contractor a lot of time really to get the system get it working properly. <coughs> um, kitchen equipment coming um, mid-April. And then, you know, obviously we have an owner move-in date um, in, in mid-June there. So the whole month, of, our goal of the whole month of May is just really be punching out. Um, site work's going to pick up in a big way here as soon as the weather breaks. We're going to start on the south side and kind of work our way north out of the building. So. That kind of, it, it benefits, I mean, it makes sense sequentially to do it that way, but it's also going to give our roofer more time to really button up the metal panels, um, get all the downspouts and gutter on as well. So that's kind of a snapshot of where we are. I think we've made some great headway. Um, kind of, you know, obviously the, the, you know, the back area of D has always, you know, continues to be, you know, where we need to be accelerating. We've met with some subs, really put together a great plan. The electricians are going to be working the next several Saturdays with as many people as they can get to come out here and just really knock it out. Um, same with the painters um, and our mechanical contractors. So.
still still good with the schedule. You got Absolutely. the move-in date week uh, of June 14th there. Absolutely. All right, I'm meeting with the movers this week to kind of finalize. So. Yeah, you should. All right, good. just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll see some paint going on the walls and make that area look yeah. completely different. Yeah, it's amazing it's how quickly. And dining, and that's, that's what we're focused on. We got another crew out starting tomorrow to start on that. So okay. that'll make a big difference. Yeah, okay. Um, so Andy hit on it earlier, our contingency, this is what's built in uh, to our contract. The, the total amount is 385000 um, I don't know how well you can see the colors on here, but you know, so far we've, we've spent 25% of the money, which is 95000 We kind of have, um, we anticipate with, uh, with some things we know are coming with some contractor acceleration, you know, another 120000 uh, to use. Um, this 18%, this 70 grand, um, that's kind of, that's uh, the under drains under the tennis course that we didn't really anticipate, but you know, we're, we're very confident at this stage of the project with how much money we have left in our contingency. But that's something we'll be able to cover and we'll also be able to cover um, a, a fence going around the uh, detention pond out in front by Carol Lee. <coughs> so, we, we feel as, we're in a very good spot. We're very comfortable to use that money. And then we, we still have $100,000 left in our contingency that we plan on, on returning to the school. So we don't anticipate this number going down at all. Uh, if anything, it might climb. So a good, I think a good way to look at it is like orange and yellow. Those are things that we, in, we have spent or anticipate on spending. Mm -hmm. Everything in you know, the, the brown and the green is either to further enhance your facility or just to give back to you, the owner, to use however you see fit. Mm -hmm. So I think we've done a, a decent job, mm -hmm. you know, of protecting that contingency along the way, not just burning through it at any opportunity. To yeah, absolutely. Better than talking about needing more. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to give it. We want to give it back. So. <laughs> now the only problem we did run into a snag, and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do the kindergarten playground. You guys feel good. I, I know you want to get that water, you know, where the tennis courts are and get that dried out and uh you don't see any problem by the time we get into May and June on the tennis courts when the sun's up higher and, and getting those done yeah. this summer. Because we have home tennis matches scheduled in August. I think. <laughs> we'll be good. Okay. Awesome. Uh, you'll see, I mean, as soon as the weather breaks and things are out, we're going to be out there working. I mean, it's, yeah. we're ready to roll. <clears throat> yeah. So a couple, we just put together a couple pictures in the back area. So up front entry, you know, obviously getting some of that done. You know, pretty calm and dry. Looking down the physical corridor and what you'll see back. Just kind of finishing up brick work there. A uh, typical classroom, obviously with the, the LVT installed. Um, mark or, yeah, mark boards up and casework in. So you can obviously see here on this one, Sean. Sorry, we're holding off. This is where your interactive displays are going to go. We're going to wait, put them up. They have, yeah, yeah, every classroom in between those whiteboards. Those whiteboards yeah, have a blue film over them to protect them. Yeah, right they're now. just that's just protection. But an interactive flat panel like this device in front of us will, will be in each classroom and it can lower down to student height or stay up for the teacher. So And it, it'll look a lot different. The lights, like I said, lights should be burning tomorrow and that just really makes everything look thin. It's so bright in there, it's like you don't even need light. Yeah. yeah. No, there's so much light. There's so much the daylighting. Light. Light. I'm really impressed. Yeah, there's. Um, I'm not going to go through all these individually. I just I just took these last week as well. But um, this is the office administrative area. This is kind of coming in the main entrance. There will be a door here. You enter a vestibule, then you go into the office over here. But. Um, and you will see those in you know, the storefront doors. The oh yeah. Aluminum doors. They're put yeah. in next week. Nice. Some of these areas, this is a teacher workroom, tons of storage and cabinetry in the office. Um, I think this is a nurse's clinic here, a conference room in the office, teacher workroom also in the main office. Um, here will be glass walls or glass panels, and, and these are art display cases from inside the art classroom. Uh, main stairwell in the middle of the building. Um, stairwell in the, um, in the media center between the uh, K2 and 3.5 media center. 
that'll be a glass front with doors. Uh, it's media center. Um, restrooms, large group restrooms. There's uh, little wash sinks on the on the either side of these little walls, so the teachers can monitor kids with uh, electric hand dryers. Some of the um, you know some of the classrooms here. Uh, I'm not sure what what level that is, but you can see some of the cabinet work and accent painting on the exterior wall. Oh, that's a computer lab. I'm sorry, that's a computer lab. The art rooms, I mean, you know, Jen got to see this. Jen took a walk around. Uh, keep in mind our art teacher, you know, she doesn't have a classroom over here at the other building. At the intermediate, she's in a modular. She has no, no water, uh, real, really no storage. So this is one of the two art rooms um, that she'll have access to. And, uh, you know, special education classrooms are in here, small group. Um, just kind of wanted to give you a feel about where, where they are. Some of the mechanical areas up on the, the very middle of the building, up on the third floor. Um, this is a teacher workroom on the second floor, for example. A lot of, you know, a lot of cabinets. Um, the doors are installed on the first and second grade area. Um, but that's a teacher workroom with ample space, so. They're going to be so. Yeah, impressed. this is uh, this you is just probably had a huge air handler on there, and you didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> the air handler, excited. Yeah, no, no, look at that. Right there. Yeah, beautiful air handler. Okay. If you ever wonder what's at the top of the building, that's what's at the top of the building. It's yeah. important stuff. It is. Yeah. It, is. Yeah. it is. It doesn't work right. It's important. Yeah. That's yeah. For sure. So, oh, the um, they were talking about the uh, bulkhead. Mm -hmm. um, in the cafeteria, there's a platform stage area here. This, this is a bulkhead that where they had to hide some duct work and things. Uh, that'll be drywall, they said, soon. And um, That's the gym, not a real good picture, but gym. And that's pretty much where we are right now. So. How about all the utilities and everything to the site and tapped into the city and so forth? Yeah, everything like that is done. Yep. And and it's been tested and inspected and approved. So, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, it's a big push now. I mean, with weather breaking and obviously with everything we need to get done. But Adam said it's always a stressful time, but we're confident. You know, we feel really good about where we are. Yeah. Wrapping it up. Um, yeah, they went over the schedule, kind of the major milestones coming up. Um, this is a sheet that we get periodically uh, that Travis and uh, the architect and uh, some it all kind of collaborate on and make sure it, it, it's all matched up. But uh, they talked about their CMR contingency up here. You can see the remaining uncommitted funds there, the uncommitted funds uh, on some soft cost items here and here. Bottom line is down here around a couple hundred thousand dollars under budget right now. That includes all the change orders plus um, any interest money that we might have is separate of that. But you, well. but you can see how important the, the, the CMR contingency is because yeah. on our own or hard contingency, we're actually over yeah. what we had set aside for change orders. Now, if you remember, some of that was to get the amount of furniture we wanted as well right. as the playground as well. Yeah. So a uh, change order might be a little bit of a misnomer in that we reinvested that money back into the building to get what we wanted. But right. <clears throat> so. That's, that's it. Yeah. You guys uh, looking good. Any questions? No, you guys are super impressive. Thank yeah. you so much. Very well, really, it's so awesome. Yeah. Look forward to wrapping it up for you. Yeah. yeah. You guys yeah, we'll get a little asphalt down. <laughs> yeah, everybody come out there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. We're ready. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you guys. So much. Thank, Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a great night. Thanks. See you Friday. One of you Friday. Yep. Or maybe both. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so the next thing, um, you know, obviously what we really do is teach students, and uh, so often for the past year, you know, we've been, there's a lot we talk about, but um, the, the curriculum and teaching has certainly been a challenge with the spring shutdown um, last spring, and then the opening of school on a hybrid schedule, trying to go to school in the middle of a pandemic, having all kinds of multiple opinions about whether you should be in school or not. Um, you know, I, I really asked um, our curriculum director, uh, Jody Raniger, I really felt it was important that the board also understands some of the curriculum planning that's going on, uh, some of the things we've been doing, but also moving forward as we try to get every you know K-12 education back on the rails, back on track across the country. 
you know, we've been fortunate here going to school since, you know, all year, uh, pretty much, you know, besides the first five weeks, you know, five days a week. And uh, that's not happening everywhere. And we've been able to do a lot this year and get a little bit of data on our kids and, and teach uh, and provide some kind of normalcy, except for the month of February, where we've had tons of snow days. But I asked Jody to come in and kind of let the board know about the curriculum adoption process, what is up this year, uh, what curriculum we're looking at, what we also need to, what loose ends we need to tie up from the previous year that was impacted due to budgets uh, in COVID, and uh, some things coming down the pike that we need to, uh, that I want to make sure the board understands with the school progress plans that you might have heard about from Governor DeWine. And also, I think we need to talk about tonight um, VLA moving forward into the 21 22 school year, and that we understand um, the, the, the benefits and the potential ramifications. Um, of, of that program and, and moving forward into the 21-22 school year. So, Jody, I will, uh, Jody provided an updated handout, or just that one document there. Yeah, it's just one, is a, a little correction with the, um, the rotation cycle, so you got that. But page 11, page 11 and 12 in your packets, um, you can look at that, but Jody, go ahead. Oh, you want me to start there, or start with Black History? Go ahead and start yeah, there. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, I mean, yeah, first on your outline is Black History Month, but you can talk a little bit about some of the things that have gone on um, with that in the month of February as well. Sure. So I thought with, uh, I would go ahead and show you, for Black History Month, we've done, I think, go back a couple of slides. Is there kindergarten first, slide one? Well. But anyway, we are teachers do a really great job every year of uh, celebrating Black History Month. And I thought just a great way to show you just a couple of slides of some of the work that the kids are doing and the bulletin boards are in. And uh, starting here with kindergarten um, out in the hallway, that, that this year the kids are doing, um, are making a book this year uh, celebrating Black History Month. And each week they selected a person um, to honor and at the end of the week, we'll have that book, or end of the month, we'll have that book together. They started off with Carter Woodson, who is, is actually the father of Black History Month. So they're starting there, and that just shows some of the work that they've done. The next slide shows more work in the primary building, where we really do take time to start recognizing these individuals that are significant and important to us. And so, of course, Martin Luther King Jr., um, but you, you know, you have Booker T. Washington, Jackie Robinson, and all of these, as these kids study in from kindergarten first through second grade, they really start to show up too when we have our wax museum. Um, I know all of you have had kids in the wax museum, and um, you always see that representation there. So it's really nice. This year, we're not going to be able to do the wax museum because of everything, but um, that's from the primary. Intermediate school, um, third grade, they did a virtual field trip of the Underground Railroad and studied Harriet Truman, or not Truman, Harriet Tubman and her work and her contributions to the, um, the freedom of slaves. Um, the next slide is also at the intermediate building, and they were studying different cultures and customs that came from African cultures and their contributions and how some of that continued into the day. Um, I love this one. At our middle school, they are in seventh grade. They are studying hidden figures, the book hidden figures, and the contributions of uh, the three ladies there and from that in the zone. Catherine Johnson, Jordan Vaughn, and Mary Johnson. And what they're doing with that project is, is they're looking at figures, significant historical figures, to make contributions that we don't know about as well as not as known. And so they're going to put together a showcase at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. But some of that's been delayed a little bit because of our days that we've been off. It's really impacted in a lot of learning. Um, this is a quilt project from our history classes at the middle school. And so the kids in the history classes put together this displayed in the hallway. And it shows um, just the uh, celebration of our journalists, authors, historians that contributed to black history. And so it says, like, we are all we, we are all woven together. And so that's really nice up in the second floor. And then the next slide um, shows our high school. And some of the works that they're reading in our AP classes and SCTP, they're reading individually on their own, just doing papers and presentations. Um, in our history and culture of rock and roll class, which is a great class, an elective, um, they really talked about some of the musicians 
and um, the contributions to the NAACP and in the uh, current events class. We have a new teacher that's teaching that this year. Her name is um, Marina uh, Barrett. And I really liked how she posed the question out to the kids. How is, um, do you feel we're any closer to Martin Luther King's dreams, uh, his, his dream speech uh, today than we were? And she said it was a great discussion with the kids because some of the kids said they feel we are closer, but we may have taken a couple of steps back here recently. Um, some that said, and she said one girl posed the, in her paper that she felt that it was easier to define race back then than it is now, than mm -hmm. the lens of what the racism. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a good conversation at a high school level with uh, black kids from us. So you can see collectively we do a nice job um, from the K-12 level celebrating and honoring um, African-American contributions. So that was really that. Very nice. Um, so next up, so I wanted to do, like Mr. Han said, go over our curriculum evaluation arc cycle, how we sort of rotate through the different content areas, and then also what our process is, and update you on what we're adopting this year, which is science. Uh, so I did want to give you that corrected page that we have to go through that. So that shows you, this shows you sort of how we cycle through each content area. Last year, we did math. And we had looked at math, and we ended up adopting, re-adopting um, the curriculum we already had in place, which was the Envision Math by Savas. So we did re-adopt that. Um, last year was a year, though, that we were um, in a place of concern with budgets. And so we typically, when we do an adoption, we do like a six-year adoption cycle because most of our content has a uh, digital license to it. So it was a six-year adoption license. And so um, last year, however, we were concerned with the, the budget, the math adoption was pretty big, and we decided to do a one-year adoption of math to keep the cost at a reasonable you know, place until we knew what was going to happen with the budget, and then do another one year this year uh, the, for the license, and then a four-year um, follow, following that. So we we'll have a one-year, one-year, and four-year adoption or purchase of the math. Um, this year for 2020-21, we're looking at science. And so we're going through the process of science for adoption. In 2021-22, that year we're not gonna really be adopting anything. We're gonna sit back and that's the year that the four-year uh, license for math will be purchased. We'll put that in the place for the budget. In 2022-23, it'll be social studies and non-core. In 2023-24, it'll be language arts. And then the following year, it's just an audio. That's sort of how we cycle through. The process itself, that when we go through this with each content area, uh, we form a committee from each content area, a representative from each building or grade level, and then they go in and they identify the gaps, needs, and concerns. So we'll look at the standards and see what our resources, where those gaps are. And we'll look at our data to see what you know, we are missing. And then we'll get different vendors, um, text from publishers, and start looking through to see what, what company has a product that, most, that fits our needs. We'll narrow that down and then do some different presentations for the teachers then as a whole. We'll decide what curriculum uh, fits best for our students. And then we'll begin transitioning in um, and some training for the upcoming school year. So this year, like I said, we're doing science. So we're in the process of evaluating it now. Uh, there were some new science standards adopted in 2018, so it's revised standards. So we are going to make sure that we have things in place for line up with the new standards. Um, our current resources are somewhat old in science. Uh, in K-2, they're very limited. Uh, we do not have actual set curriculum. Uh, teachers have resources um, and um, materials, equipment that we can actually stem. Um, classes or intervention class um, in grades three, four. We did adopt the last cycle National Geographic Science, which they really do like. That's going to be discontinued this after this year, so we will have to look at something new, which is unfortunate for that. Grades five, eight, we had Blinko back 2008. We did not get anything new at that last adoption, uh, so we will be definitely need at the middle school to get something more updated and aligned to the revised standards. And then in grades 9, 12, 
Um, we have Puritan Sabbath, um, and it's, the materials are in good shape. However, we'll have to update some of our lab equipment and get the updated um, online resources for that. So district-wide, um, we don't have really anything systemic like we do in math. In math, we have our envision that is systemic, so it's that same common vocabulary all the way through. Um, and so that's part of our goal for this, this adoption is to get um, science that's specifically aligned to Ohio standards. Now, when you go to adopt science, you do need to look at the resources because some of the science resources are aligned to the national standards. So we do want to make sure that we get um, resources that are aligned specifically to Ohio. So we do want to look for something systemic at each grade band um, and then provide students with resources that are whether they're textbooks, online, or consumables. Um, we've had consumables before with some of our past adoptions and they haven't really been um, as favorable for our teachers or our students. So now that we've got a little experience with that, I would say we'd probably steer from that. Um, the publishers we're currently looking at um, is Savas, which their program's called Interactive Science, McGraw-Hill, Inspire Science, and then HMH Fusion Science. So the teachers right now have these materials in their hands, and they're um, exploring through them, seeing what they like. They have visual access where they can get you know, play around. Um, in our upcoming um, PD day, they're going to have time to uh, get together collectively and sort of have conversations on what they see is working well. March, April is when, when we do narrow it down to a vendor that we would like, one or two will do vendor presentations. Um, in April, May, we'll select our new uh, curriculum for the different grade band. And then in June or July, you guys will approve the purchase and, and we'll then plan for our training in August. So that's sort of the science adoption process. If any questions on that. Can you go back up on this side? I think this is what you were maybe saying a minute ago, but like K to two has some that get like National Geographic. I see like all these different ones. Is it like is it grade specific? Or like well, that's band what specific, or that's what you're it, moving to trying to get. The state standards one. are that they still identify like a primary band and then a, a intermediate or grades three to five. And right now, you know, we do have National Geographic in grades three and four, but nothing in fifth grade. And and the challenge is that when I say nothing. Uh, a lot of the curriculum is developed internally on right. our own, and you, you can have some gaps doing that when it's left independently. And it doesn't restrict any teacher's freedom, but we need to, when we hire a new teacher, last year we hired some science teachers, uh, you know, and when they're new, and they ask, what resources do I have? And we're like, oh, the other teacher has developed those over the that's 25 really years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really hard for a new teacher, right. you know, and we also want it to be aligned, because as we get bigger, we're going to have, and we're having it now, where you have teachers, not, there's just not one teacher doing fifth grade science anymore. You might have two teachers doing fifth grade science, and you want that curriculum, they can teach different ways, but you want the learning targets to be the same. And th that's one reason why, you know, we really, Jody, when she sets these meetings up with the teachers, for input, I mean, we do listen, but we also have to kind of guide and direct that as a district, we need to head in this direction and make improvements in this area. So how can we do it, you know? And that's that's one major goal, I think, that Jody has. With so I guess, are there publishers that are specific to grade levels, or is um, Go ahead, Jody. Some, so um, some of them so are heading more at K-8, so when you adopt something like our math, is a K-8. Oh. So we're going to try, now what I had listed is what we currently had. Our goal is to try to get something at least for sure K-5 to be consistent, okay. since we're going to move to a K-5 building for next year, and then a 6-8. So those bands, so there's where I'm showing with our current resources, we're sort of it's fragmented somewhat um, just from the past. And so therefore our goal is to try to get us to have consistency K-5, and then have a 6-7-8. Um, Sometimes, I mean, more than likely, like with our math, we did go with the same vendor, um, but I don't know until the teachers get in there and see what's really relevant and at the level of rigor for the grade level that they want. But if we just That's focus on consumable materials and we don't get some online textbooks or, or hard copies for class sets, I mean, our last adoption was 2008, yes. and it won't be for another six years. Yes. So we could go 18 years without new science curriculum. And it's probably important that we try to, as we're in this transition, and it's the year for science that we try to, science is important, math, I mean, all the subjects are important, but 
certainly reading, math, and, and science are areas of emphasis, you know. And the one thing with these adoption accounts, where most of our uh, uh, resources have a digital license connected to it, it's not like before where, say, one year we'll buy textbooks for our students, and then those can last 10, 12 years of being depending for a long time. But when they have a digital seat to them, every six years we have to, we're sort of locked in to knowing we're going to have to buy again, you know, the digital seat again for kids. So you can do a, a smaller, um, you know, uh, Amount of time for your digital seats, your license? I assume the digital, oh, it's based on the license. The it's content's constantly updated. They, some, some, uh, right. some do. But you have to buy, yeah, they, they, they get you trapped. They hook, yeah. And, and you know, it's great, this online learning's great, but right. when you gotta spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on textbooks and curriculum, they get you trapped. And if you're completely online, when you renew that, you gotta pay for that again. Now they have very little output and cost, it's all digital content. Right. You know, right. but they, they aren't printing and, and things like that. Right. So, um, so sometimes, you know, if you don't want to make a new purchase, then you want to make sure you have class sets of textbooks. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, six years from now, when that license expires, you can still use those books. But if you don't have a book, you've got to buy the online co content to access it. So. so it does put us in that cycle where we need to be consistent um, mm -hmm. with the purchase. But that's sort of how that process is done. Um, the math adoption update, that's the adoption we did last year, and I sort of spoke on that a moment ago, but we did uh, re-adopt Envision Math, which was uh, a program we had done the last math cycle, which was really good that we kept consistency in that content area, so, and I think it was really good for our families as well, because our teachers now have that rhythm down with that program, our pacing guys are aligned to that. We see having a specific math program that the vocabulary is the same and the presentation of the facts and the, um, I mean the instructional strategies are the same. So we did readopt that, but what we added this year or with that adoption was two programs. We added a program called Success Maker, which is an adaptive online uh, program that replaced Compass. So it was a program we already had, but um, we replaced it with that and the current data from that is showing gains we're going to be competing with that program here um, in March, but that program we get off to a rough start because of the, the how the year has been. We've had a short instructional day um, at, at the for the school year, um, less time for the teachers to actually try to get that program in. So it wasn't um, off to the start that we wanted, but we do feel like we're going to have really help in that area. And then we added guided math, which is a hands-on math program. Um, it's um, supplemental to support our vision math. We bought that to um, implement this year, but we actually paused that whole thing because where it is hands on in the year of COVID, we thought it probably wasn't the best time to really implement. Is that K5? That is K5. Yes, K5. And so that, we're going to do training. We sort of paused that. The materials are coming in here um, this month, and we're going to do a training in March and plan to implement next year. But it's going to be aligned to our vision math. It's, 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 it's much more manipulative, it's hands-on, right. it supports our curriculum because these little kids, uh, you know, little, in, in grades K to two, even three and four, accessing math curriculum on a computer all day is difficult and you want to be able to, <laughs> to support that and, you know, this guided math program does that. Now, last year, as we talked about, we had some concerns last spring in March and April when we found out our budget was going to be cut up to the governor said 20%. That didn't end up happening to that level, but you know we ended up doing a one-year math purchase last year, and we we purchased a few guided math kits, but not enough to cover grades K to five. So those are things that I just want you to be aware of that we have to get that back on pace to our curriculum adoption process, and, and we do have a plan that Jody handed out to you there that. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to make that four year, one, a one year math adoption this year again, and then a four year that gets us back to our six year cycle. So, okay. So really, that's it. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good job. Great job. This is what I had before. This is what I thank you guys, though, for all that you've done and to get us here, like um, last, you know, in August, and we're making that decision to get us to open up. And um, just thank you for your bravery and the kids being here in person. It's going to make a difference. Thank you, Jody. Which takes me to my next point. In case you get <laughs> questions from parents 
community members, hey, is Bloom Carroll going to extend their day, extend their school year, start very early? Um, that is ultimately for the board to decide, but I want to make sure that when you hear the Columbus Dispatch or the news media talking about these things happening in some districts, the governor's concern and everybody's concern has been about you know, learning loss and how to mitigate that loss and, and get kids caught up. It's going to take a while mm -hmm. in some of these districts, but I want you to keep in mind that there's differences between our district and a lot of districts like ours and then districts in other parts of the state. And um, there, are some, there are some limitations that, I don't, that I'll just say, I don't feel the governor completely understood with this request um, to extend the school day, to extend the school year. We have a collective bargaining agreement um, and it's for seven and a half hours a day that our teachers are contracted up to 185 days a year. And we have limited funding from the state. We know at this point what our budget was reduced to and that we will be funded, at, it sounds like, at fiscal year 19. Now it's 2021, 2022, and we're being funded, you know, at the, at the revenue uh, from three years ago. So that's, that's a, bit of a bit of an issue. We do get a little bit of wellness and success funds, but it's very limited. We get around, I think, 140 to $150,000 in that ballpark range. And Travis can talk about that. He's talked about it with you. He's shown you how those funds are being used for those supports for our students uh, with counselors and, 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 and other things like that. But we are not receiving a huge amount of wellness and success funds because we have very little Title I at-risk student population. So the districts that have a higher at-risk population they're receiving a lot more funds in a lot of the urban areas, the inner cities. And they haven't been in school for a year. We have been in school since August 24. We were on that hybrid schedule. Our kids were going two or three days a week. We quickly got out of that. I believe the board made the right decision in doing that. It was not easy. It was tough. It's going to, it could be tough moving forward. But I think you know, we, we had to balance and implement safety procedures. But our kids were able to learn. Our kids were here learning. And it's been, for the most part, five days a week, with the exception of some snow days that also impacted us. But we have 93% of our students attending five days a week, to 7%, we're down to 162 students currently on VLA. But um, the governor isn't really funding this request besides wellness and success funds. And we're, we're estimated to receive maybe a 10 to $15,000 increase in our wellness and success funds between this year and next year. So in my opinion, we also are looking at data. The, the kindergarten readiness assessments from the fall of 2020 were, was higher than the fall of 2019 and 2018 for students performing at the highest level. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe in the spring, parents were so concerned that there was more instruction in support taking place at home. Because you know our, we were providing work in the spring, but the kids still missed two months, two and a half months of school. Uh, maybe it's a good group of kids, and they're just, you know, they, they're just, they score high. You know, there's, there, there's no clear reason for that, but I want to make sure you know what our data says. The third grade reading guarantee data in the fall of 2020 was higher than the fall of 2019 and consistent with the fall of 2018. So uh, Jody is here, and she was talking about the math program success maker, and we're starting to get data on that. And Jody, feel free to jump in here. Uh, we went over a report yesterday um, in our K-2 uh, age groups. And um, the data showed that um, most of the kids are right on the, the mark where they're supposed to be. And we were looking at a second grade report for, for you know, second grade, middle of the year. Is that maker? Yeah, you were looking at? Like you about, yeah, 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 just that, okay. And so keep in mind, we have me uh, measurement of academic progress. That's a program we use here to assess kids in reading and math. But we didn't have spring state testing last year. So the only data we have is math. And star. It is math. Yeah. We have some STAR. We have uh, some success maker now. We yeah. have the fall third grade reading guarantee. And we have, um, we have the crawl data from kindergarten in the fall. Right now, our data is not showing an alarm, but some of these kids in these other parts of the state have not been in school for 12 months. Our kids missed two and a half, but they have been in since August. So right now with the fact that we are moving, opening up a new school, we need to have a late start. We've talked about our school calendar. We can't start August 
5th, a half early start, or August 1st. Um, we're opening up, we're, we're converting the, our current 3-4 elementary to a preschool and learning center with a couple ESC classrooms. We need to get that building ready. We typically have a summer reading program for students that have not passed the third grade reading guarantee that are in third grade and still need to pass it to go to fourth grade. Mm -hmm. The state has waived the, um, the state is waiving the uh, policy to hold students back if they don't pass the third grade reading guarantee this year. They did that last year as well. So we are not planning to offer, and we don't, besides here at the middle school and high school, we're in a transition with our elementary buildings. And we don't, we just don't feel like right now that those are things we can do. But what are things we will be doing? We will be submitting a plan as required by April 1st to the General Assembly. We will be submitting a plan on our website so the public can see it. But Jody's going to be working on that with our teachers, with our principals. Some things that we have talked about is making sure that throughout the spring and summer months in June and July that our parents understand that we have access to online programs. If you, uh, in the governor's, in the frequently asked questions, um, some of these programs, the summer programs, tutoring or remote options could also be considered. Now, they want to use remote options to address remote learning deficiencies. And, you know, for some kids that have been in school, remote options might help support them. But we're looking at June and July, making sure that parents know that Lexia, our reading program for phonics uh, development at our elementary levels, and actually it's, it's actually K to, uh, K, to, K to 4, and then we have it available for uh, students with special needs in middle school and high school. But we have... Uh, access 24 7 throughout the months of june and july where kids can access lexia for reading um, success maker during the summer for math support and intervention and we'll send out reminders and, and do those types of things but um, we also have a check and connect program at the high school going on um, to target at-risk students that need more support somebody to check in with them routinely during the week um, about how they're doing in a lot of areas but mainly academically so those are some of the things that our plan will include. And if you guys, you know, start to have concerns or have concerns, you know, please let me know what direction you would like me to go. But I wanted to kind of lay the foundation that, you know, that right now there's some districts like us and around us that are different than Cleveland right now or Dayton that are still shut down. There are 416 districts open across the state. I think 178 are hybrid. And I think 10 are, uh, I believe 10 are still fully remote, and maybe five are um, partial hybrid, where they're bringing in like elementary kids a couple of days a week. So all that information is on the Ohio Department of Education website. I looked at that again today, but we've been, we've been here, and a lot of school districts have, some have not. But just wanted to make sure you guys understood, understood that. Do you have any? So our schedule, school schedule, staying the same, farmers. For the, re for the rest of this year with the VLA, we said that we would offer that throughout the course of the year. Um, am I frustrated with that? Would I like to you know, get those 40 minutes back? Yes, but are we asking our teachers to manage two things? We are. Um, I really, in my opinion, feel like the current schedule we're using right now, the 45 minute early release is the best we're gonna be able to do and stay, to, to continue to give our teachers time to communicate and interact with the VLA kids and also plan and grade, those are different lessons than what they're teaching in the classroom. So unless we hire people, but there's a, there's a cost to do that. So, you know, I, I think we, I really think looking back, we've, we've been able to make some good decisions. And, um, you know, I want my kids here, you know, the full day and not out 45 minutes early, but I kind of get the whole uh, dynamics of it. And, I just don't see us this school year being able to go away from that. But and, and I, that's the next thing I want to get into and talk, you know, talk with so you guys just about. Just to make sure I'm clear, I'm reading. it's to submit plans to address kids at a ballpark, right? That's mm -hmm. it. It's not like there's some sort of mandate or any, anything like that. It's so the, the governor made the statement in the form of a request. I was told by OSBA ambassador that it could be proposed in legislation in the near future. But right now, it's a request. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with it. Um, you know, they, they do want us to consider, you know, who are we, 
who are we targeting, which students are impacted, how are we identifying them, and we have some data here. Um, you know, we can look and see that 74% of the kids are on track at second grade level in math. Well, that means, you know, there's, you know, there's some kids that are not, and, and how can we identify them, and how can we provide additional resources and, and maybe some interventions here during the school year now for the rest of the year, but also make sure that there isn't a big gap for two and a half months or three months during the summer and provide that support. But you're saying the data you see does not indicate a significant gap or change from pre-pandemic no. levels. No, it was actually, it was actually better. Because on one, one could argue the other way, right? Like, yeah. well, what were you doing you pre-pandemic yeah. for those kids? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. too, right. so. I had a conversation with the teacher, and I asked, like, were most kids behind? You know, you got to think, when they start the year, they've been out since March. They're yeah. behind. But the growth they've made because they've been in school, they've been able to catch up. Right. So, yeah. you, know, are, you know, are there less kids behind because they've been in school? I would, I would argue, based on my own son and his peers, that the answer is yes. Yeah. That this, getting them here helps catch them up. And, and one message, you know, that, that we've had since the beginning of the year is that we, we are not going to be able to teach everything that you teach in a normal school year. You're losing several days of school with this yeah. early release schedule still better than other places, but you're still missing time. So our teachers have had to identify key standards that they want to teach that are critical to go on to the next <coughs> grade. And, and the data shows that, you know, we're, we're keeping our kids where they need to be and probably above a lot of other districts. So in terms of a big learning plan with extended school days going into the evening, uh, we would have to negotiate with the union. We would have to pay them. Uh, we would, if we're going to extend the school year, I don't think parents want to send their children to school all summer long. I could be wrong. I think the parents want their kids in school when they're supposed to be in school, but they also value the breaks when they're supposed to be scheduled. So um, I don't know if the kids that truly needed the support would always be here. It might be ones that are already achieving pretty high. Right. You know. So any any huge disagreements or concerns or like go. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we need to start having a discussion about um, about BLA um, as well. Um, you know, we right now we have you can see in the enrollment report uh, in February it said 168 students on BLA. Uh, we're down to 162 uh, currently. And uh, that's about six to seven percent of our students are on BLA. That means 93 percent of our students, over almost 2,000 students, are attending in school in person with us. And um, you know, we, we talked about why we managed it this way. And you know that the temporary additional cost of uh, a couple teachers, if you have 160 students, potentially you're going to need two teachers to manage those students. Um, <coughs> most of them right now are at the Middle school and high school level, if you, uh, if you take a look at this up here, you can see that um, out of our online students, you know, 39% are at the middle school, um, about 27% are at the high school, and then around 22% at the primary, and at the intermediate school, uh, about 13% of the students. So I'll be honest, there are students that have medical uh, concerns, and, and they, this is a good option for them this year. Um, there, there are some students that are also doing it con for convenience, that had attendance issues previously at the upper levels, at the middle school and high school. Um, you know, I, I, think that, um, I, I think that we really need to consider, if we're going to do this and we're going to have you know, 100 and more than 125 students, we're probably going to need a couple teachers. Um, have you asked who planning on doing it again? What's that? Have you asked who has intentions of doing it again? No, not at, not at this point. And here, here's some of the reasoning right now. I, I'm not planning to recommend at this time that we, we continue to offer VLA. It's too early. It's February. We, you know, we're still six months away from the next school year, from August, and we're starting late, almost seven. If you had a couple teachers, you know, with benefits, you're looking at $120,000, um, you know, of, uh, of expenditure there for salaries and benefits. Um, right now, we have the impact on the schedule is that, you know, almost 2,000 students or 93% are being released 45 minutes early. 
And, and I continue to feel like we need to see some normalcy in our school schedule, get back to a normal school schedule, the normal length of a school day. Um, if, if you have possible withdrawals, um, you know, if people have to make a decision, I know there are other districts not offering this option, even in, in this uh, Franklin County suburban areas. Um, next school year, they've already made that decision. But if we have some withdrawals, yeah, we lose a, you know, a little bit of, of state money. Um, if you lose, if 50 students withdraw and we lose about $2,400 in state aid per student, that's $120,000 right there. Or we spend $120,000 for a couple teachers to continue to, to offer this. I think most people will come back um, to the district if they have to make a decision. And um, I, I just feel that, you know, right now, if we don't, if we don't hire two teachers, we're going to have to uh, remain on this early release schedule in order to ask our teachers to manage this. And there's 2,000 students that are getting out of school 45 minutes early because of that. So, there's Travis, do you have any idea of the one of the 160 kids that are in the funding total for them? I mean, are we seeing that there's a huge special ed population or? I don't think so. I mean, the, well, these 162 are um, on the, in the VLA. That's what I mean. So, like, if, like funding wise, let's assume they would all be. They're not going to just take 2,400. They're going to take six. Yeah, they're going to take the full 6,200. We, we get about 2,200 for the resident uh, mm -hmm. students that go elsewhere. So you do lose about 3,800 uh, net for each of these kids if they were to leave to go to an online school. If they're not funded differently. Exactly. Right. So yes. I'm just curious. Like if, you know, let's say half of those left. It's a, it's a concern. I'm not, mm. It would be a big chunk. Mm -hmm. Way more than 120,000. Yeah, I would agree. Do you, is there an, a plan that maybe asked us to get an idea of the number? Because I mean, I know some people aren't coming because they don't want their kid to wear a mask. So if that means it goes away, the kid's coming back. Right. You know, I mean, there's a, yeah. tons of different reasons. But what, you know, I don't think 168 are going to stimulate no. it. No. But could 70? Maybe. No. And if that ends up being, of those 70, if that funding ends up being $300,000, $400,000, which it very well could be, depending on the type of student they are, yeah. it's something we could, you know. And if there are only 70, you need two teachers. Could you do one, you know, that can manage it or whatever? Um, but by law, in order to manage online students, you can only be assigned 100 and, uh, up to 125 students. So if you're teaching. teaching them, right? If you're if you are responsible for teaching them, but if you if, if whatever you chose. To well, they they would they would be the, if if they're the teacher of record. And if you stay with VLA, yes. Yeah. So yeah. What do the teachers within the school think of the 45 minute release? Well, in, well, I can tell you, I'm guessing already. You're so yeah, they, they, miss the, they miss the instructional time. Uh, and, well, I'm guessing, too, managing yeah. multiple other kids. They don't like so from right. a teacher perspective here in the school, right. I'm assuming, again, assumption I haven't talk, right. talked to a few, and right. I get the feeling they do not like. They, they don't. I mean, I, no I'm not sure. going to pinpoint a building, but I've had two buildings contact me, and they would love to go back to a normal schedule. There are teachers that don't have any VLA students. There are some that have... I was going to say, is that because more, of the more, number of VLA for like like grade level? What's that? There's less VLA at this point, right? So yeah. at different buildings. Yeah. I mean, you can see you can see it right there. I mean, mm -hmm. the grade levels, how many? Well, you have a kindergarten or you got seven, seven yeah. grade. I mean, there's no way each, what, each of them have two. Right. And right. some of them don't have any. Some of them might have That's four. Somebody has yeah. four and somebody has yeah. zero. <clears> but <throat> I know there, I have had people say, well, we would like to be back on our normal schedule. And I've had a lot of parents. <laughs> say that too. I so like it just because I want that other five, six, seven minutes for when the kid's taking a test. Oh, it's you know, like I just feel like my huge, kid is being under review. Huge the, the review is test because the period so short. Yeah, it makes a huge what difference. Are other schools that are offering VLA? Are they also? I'm sure you talked to other superintendents. Mm -hmm. Doing it. Are they also releasing early? No, some are going four days a week. And then the mm -hmm. and then the fifth day Probably. is remote for everybody, so the teachers can work remotely with those students. It's a lot more prep, I would think. For the yeah. Well, the kids, our kids are in school more. If you if you miss six six and a half hours on Friday, uh, compared to the forty five minutes, our kids are missing like two two hours and fifteen minutes a week. Yeah. Right. You know? No, so that's a good. It's, it's our kids are getting more. Yeah. Our kids are getting about three more hours of instruction going five days a week, dismissing forty five minutes early, than going four days a week right. and having all day Friday to do remote. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, just something that I want to. Kind of put out there we're again we're still a long way away but i think we need to get back to normal we need to get back to normal schedule um 
I think a lot of these people, we, we are continuing to get emails daily. Just in, in the couple days that this packet was put together, we went from 168 down to 162. Case numbers with the virus are dropping. People are feeling more com comfortable and confident. I, I think we need to. I think we need to get back to normal. And a lot of these students need to be in school. So, all right. Um, last thing with curriculum, real quick, is uh, middle school. Um, you know, we we are looking at implementing the, the one to one program. I think Travis uh, has been able to use some uh, CARES Act money, Travis. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help with those purchases. So we're looking at being a one-to-one -one in grades six through 12 next school year, just not at the high school. And we had CARES Act money to do that. So, okay. Um, other, any questions about any of the curriculum? I know it was a lot, but I felt like we needed to spend some time, time on that. Yes. So. Okay. If you move on to Section 3 uh, on the 2020-21 planning, obviously, you know, we talked a little bit about that with the curriculum, but, um, you know, if you look at page 15 and 16, again, you can see our, our current enrollment, and, um, you know, th there are some areas, there are some areas that, um, you know, have some concern as we continue to move forward. Sometimes what I try to do um, seems better than the OFCC process, to be honest, um, is to take the current enrollment and then put that number into next year's, like the kindergarten students this year, 165, put it in the first grade, and we're seeing about 2 to 3% growth a year consistently for the past several years. That's about, that's about five kids per grade level on average. So you plop the five additional kids in there, and then that gives you an estimated projection of where we might be next year. Uh, per grade level, and then you look at the number of sections that we have, a number of teachers at each grade level, and there are a couple areas that, you know, I really think we're going to have to watch um, that, you know, it could potentially require a teacher, and uh, that would be fourth grade and fifth grade, you know, you're looking at maybe 170 students, ballpark with six sections, you're looking at 28.3. Uh, now some of those kids, I do want to point out, a lot of those kids get pulled out at fourth grade with our gifted intervention specialist for reading and math, dropping the numbers in those classes. So on paper it looks like one thing, fourth grade is a little unique. In third grade, they pull kids out for gifted instruction. Um, the other area, sixth grade, or, uh, fifth grade as well, we're looking at 157 plus the five, around 162. Six teachers currently, you're looking at about 27 a class. And then the freshman group, um, that's, you know, the eighth grade group is our pretty big group right now, 197. If you add a few more students in there that move in, uh, you're, if we have seven sections, which we traditionally at the middle school and high school, you have about, set, you have a nine period day. Um, you know, most of, the, most of the time we're looking at seven sections because the teachers have a lunch and a prep in there. And, um, you know, we could have some concerns there. We're also looking at some ways to, some things we can do with scheduling to add an eighth section of a world studies, of a freshman English class, of a, you know, physical science class. Those are some classes that, you know, freshmen typically take to drop that down, uh, just being able to add another, you know, have another teacher pick up another section. So the, the other thing is to go to your point, if you scroll up to the enrollment report again, the one before that, sorry. Because I always like to look at the, I call it the mobility factor from the change from one year to the next. So if you look at 167 resident kindergarten students in 19 and 20, that d dropped by three, you know, this year. That's not normal. But I can guarantee you every time you look at one of these reports, if you look at the change from seventh to eighth and eighth to ninth. So on this one, it's 175 to 185 and one, I can't see that, but uh Going from eight to ninth, I can guarantee it's always going to be an increase. You can imagine why, whether it be for athletics or for some other um, activities at the high school level. So that, again, points to the, the, the potential problem we might have in the freshman class. That could even be with the kids who have been homeschooled, parents have right, high that's, school level. So with, exactly, with 185, and I'm just looking at the resident eighth graders, yeah. uh, that's bound to increase. That class has always been big. That's yeah, class. going into it's the ninth grade. Big, so. Yeah. It'd be nice if it was just five per, just right. growing, you know, for the total of the 52 there. The, but uh, 
you just see some patterns there when you look at this year over year. What was the big drop in the uh, That's for, for for so you lose right now with the number of programs, uh, you lose on typ typically about 40 students uh, from that sophomore to their junior year. I think we have 51 apply. I could see 35 to 40 actually uh, go ahead and make that commitment uh, after they get accepted, but we, we're typically seeing around 40 in that junior class go. So that's those are kids that obviously aren't in the building. Uh, they're down at, at they're up at Eastland or down at Fairfield Career Center, so you see a big drop there. But yeah, so you know, I just want want you to be aware of um, maybe maybe some of the concerns there as well. So um, Travis, I didn't know if you had any anything else you wanted to, to look at there. No, just the that ninth grade going the next year is yeah concerning. Um, in, in terms of you know personnel, obviously I don't see any need with administration to make any changes or additions. Uh, we will monitor the fourth, fifth, and ninth grades. Um, you know, if you look at this list, these are some things to consider um, with the pandemic, with the needs that we've seen in, you know, students and, and, you know, just their emotional health. We added a school guidance counselor three years ago, and one area that we were able to save a little bit of money this school year, we had a transition. Um, go, going into next school year, you know, I, I think there's a clear need to, uh, and the benefits of, of that elementary counselor and social worker and what they're able to do with our students. The fact that we're going into a thousand student elementary building, you know, maybe, maybe 10,070 kids, you know, um, with, with that number of students, with the fifth grade being out there, with um, the fact that we have two, two principals for 1,100 kids, uh, we don't have a lot of discipline at those age groups, but it's more the emotional uh, counseling that we need. Um, you know, I think there, there's a potential to definitely um, put this counselor position back to a full-time five-day-a-week rather than four-day-a-week position. But you can see the estimated cost of that. Uh, other personnel considerations, you know, we're, we're maybe looking at... Um, you know, potentially we got the custodial position. We're adding a 110,000 square foot building. We're adding about 50,000 square feet of cleaning. Um, we have a preschool and learning center that will need the staff, and then we have the elementary. Uh, so we think that you know, obviously uh, taking the hours, increasing the hours. We have a uh, six-hour custodian at the primary during the day and a uh, four-hour custodian in the evening at the intermediate school, but with the amount of classrooms, over 55 classrooms in this elementary school in a large gym and a large cafeteria, we're gonna have a lot of space. And we knew this was coming, we've talked about this, but we're probably gonna need to look at the custodial hours as well and positions. Um, you, you know, we talk about the, maybe the high school is getting an influx. And if you understand the dynamics of the high school, they have lunch during fifth, sixth, and seventh period, and they lose the cafeteria, which is a large study hall area, because we have lunch in it. So we need to use classrooms during periods fifth, sixth, during the fifth, sixth, and seventh periods. And what happens is you need three bodies. If you can have one study hall monitor watch 70 kids, you may need three classrooms for that at lunchtime in a traditional classroom. Well, one person can't be in three classrooms at one time. So what happens is our licensed teachers end up not teaching during fifth, sixth, and seventh. Maybe um, what, I, what I mean is may, maybe two of them aren't teaching when they could be teaching an elective class or another section of a class. And you know potentially we may need another study hall monitor, which is a cost-effective way to provide another section of a core curriculum class or an elective if you potentially hire a lunch slash study hall monitor for only three periods a day. There's very limited cost with that. You can see that there on the spreadsheet. Um, at the middle school, you know, one thing they've learned from the pandemic is splitting the lunches. You know, you have 170 kids and you split them in half rather than have them all eat at one time and then all go out and play. If you split them in half and have half play and half eat and then flip flop them, you have less behavioral issues. They're hardly having any behavioral issues. So we're, we're seeing four lunch periods at the middle school right now. That's, that's going to go down to three, so we can reduce some time on our current lunch monitors. But if we could potentially add another monitor for safety, we could have two in the cafeteria and two outside monitoring kids 
that are playing, and that's at really at no cost because the other three monitors have some time, 45 minutes reduced, and then if you add a monitor, she's picking up that 45 minutes, he or she would be picking up that 45 minutes, so just something to look at to help manage the middle school a little bit more. Um, you know, tech, continue, can, we continue to have more devices for technology to manage. Um, you know, if you remember, we eliminated some extended days uh, for some personnel, ag, family consumer science, counselors, marching band, uh, because of the budget constraints uh, from last spring. Some varsity coaching positions, six different coaching positions uh, we eliminated, you know, is that something we wanna consider? The classroom teachers, you know, like I said, we might need maybe a fourth and fifth grade. Maybe we need something at the high school. You know, you're potentially looking at a, you know, on the low end, $120,000 in two teaching positions. If you have VLA, you're maybe looking at 120,000 if you have to hire a couple there. Um, you know, that's, that's a big number to put on one year right here of cost. Now multiply that over a five-year forecast, you know, and that changes your five-year forecast quite a bit. So I'd love to hear, you know, if you guys have any questions or thoughts or if I'm just providing too much information right now. Well, what, so what are the green highlights? I'm that's, re that's really what we had just kind of said, that we're just going to kind of assume that we need to move forward with. Yeah. We, would our, we had looked at these uh, reduction in um, extended days and the uh, supplementals as a, one, as a one year, unless something really right. you know, went haywire with the budget. Those were going to be one year uh, types of reductions. And then we knew the, the custodial additions we've talked about yeah. for quite a while now, as well as the, um, the guidance counselor. But the ones that aren't in green, they're currently not uh, forecasted, so that certainly we would have to add to the personnel the, budget. The BLA just had that discussion, right? Mm -hmm. so right. that's obviously contingent upon ultimately where we end up. It's right, six, three, months. Four months. Yeah. six months. Yeah, so, um, you know, the next sheet, it, it's on your desk. I had to update it, um, you know, just so you could see our custodial staff, what buildings are in, what their hours are currently, what we think they need to go to and working with dentists to cover and get our facilities clean and ready for school the next day. Uh, and take care of the, the facilities in the grounds. We're gonna have more grass to cut at the new elementary school. We still have to mow the uh, preschool and learning center in Lithopolis. Um, so, you know, we can also, uh, if you look at your spreadsheet on your desk, there might be a position that maybe due to a retirement, um, maintenance director feels maybe we don't need to fill and that can cut down on the number of hours in salary that we actually increase. So we're probably looking at more about a 1.25 full-time employee increase rather than a 1.75 on the maintenance staff. So um, that's why I provided that, that update there. So really I think that's, you know, with transportation we're in good shape. The bus routes will be better. Less kids in terms of, uh, you know, better balance. Food service, we're okay. Secretarial, we're okay. Uh, but those are some of the areas that I just wanted to make sure that you were seeing that could be priorities. But, you know, personnel, Travis will tell you, he's done this for 20 years. I mean, personnel is the most expensive thing to add. It's not a one-time purchase. You're committed to it for long haul. And benefits aren't, you know, sometimes benefits aren't included in some of these. So just something to think about. All right. Um, school building information, I just want to make sure you... you uh, Kind of understand what we have. I mean, in terms of naming, you know, it's been Bloom Elementary um, for years. It's been the Bloom Carroll Intermediate School when the district went away from separate elementaries and consolidated the elementary schools. Um, you know, that the way that building is going to function in Lithopolis uh, as part of our facility plan, it, it's right now we're looking at three preschool classrooms over there, and we're also looking at a program called Prep for Success. It's a uh, behavioral unit three different classrooms, a K2, a 3-5, and a 6-8, potentially could be over there. Um, and we're not using the fourth grade section, uh, which is the 1941 section for students. I really don't want to put students in those facilities. Uh, but the main area near the office, uh, near the library, there are definitely three classrooms we can use for preschool there. And then up on the third grade, which is the back part from 1960, uh, the ESC, would like to uh, potentially put those classrooms over there. Right now they're being held at Forest Rose and uh, they're, they're being removed from there. And I'm gonna show you here in a few minutes how few classes we actually host 
compared to other school districts in the consortium. We have one ESE consortium classroom in our high school. It's a multiple handicap classroom for grades 9 through 12. We have several students from Bloom Carroll in there, but we also have kids from Amanda, I think, for a union that come into that classroom. But, you know, other school districts are having three or four classrooms at their school district, and we just haven't been able to due to the lack of space. So um, the preschool and learning center, will I, will I bring to the board sometime this spring or some of the official naming? I, I, I probably will, um, but I think it makes sense to call it the preschool and learning center. Um, the Bloom Carroll Elementary School, obviously there's the address. We're looking at, we've worked with our principals. Uh, they've held several meetings. I've met with them. Um, due to the schedule um, with related arts and uh, those, those people that we share uh, in the building, uh, we get more instructional time, but they really felt like the 9 o'clock to 3.30 for the student day was most appropriate. And then at the middle school and high school, obviously grade bands, you know, the change here will be grades six through eight. We'll have some open classrooms here now. And uh, the high school, grades nine to 12. So um, if you look at this next sheet, this is the county consortium classrooms. Uh, Amanda Clare Creek, Walnut Township, Bloom Carroll, Burn Union, uh, Fairfield Union, uh, and then Prep for Success. So you can see here that some of these school districts, Amanda Clear Creek is hosting four classrooms in their buildings and the kids in gold are from Bloom Carroll and then you have kids from Amanda and, and Fairfield and Burn and Walnut Township being bused there to meet the needs. So this, is, this has been this way for several years. Um, it's been fairly consistent. Walnut Township, they have three classrooms um, that, that they provide and we do have students over there as well. Um, at uh, Bloom Carroll, you can see we only have one classroom here. Um, five of the ten students are ours, and then there are five from another district. Uh, at um, Burn Union, they have one classroom currently. In the past, they've actually hosted more. They are building a new school, um, so the, you know they may take some back. Fairfield Union has three different ED units, and um, then Prep for Success. These classrooms are currently at uh, developmental disabilities uh, down on 37. And those potentially are a couple classrooms and maybe one more that we might be able to host. Uh, so, we have, so we have space. And uh, there are times where we have had students in these units as well. So I just wanted to give you a look at that. The preschool, these are, these are all the, uh, the ESCs run the preschools for Amanda, Fairfield, Liberty, Bloom Carroll, and Walnut. So, and they're not Walnut Township, I'm sorry, uh, but for the ones I just mentioned. And you can see Amanda has had three classrooms. Um, Bloom Carroll, we have one currently in the intermediate school, and then we have two uh, located on a normal year. Two are located at Liberty Union. They're hosting Bloom Carroll students in the ESC program. So the, the benefit is that Bloom Carroll students that need preschool services due to their, their, their special needs um, they will be in, a blue, in the Blue Carroll district. They won't be bused out or transported by vans out of the school district. So, Are they bringing the peers back next year? Do you know? I, I believe, yes. I, I believe at this time we, okay, we reduced it due, due to um, social ahead. distancing. Yeah. And when I say we, remember the ESC runs the preschool program. Um, but, you know, they service the, each community and the kids right. in those communities. So That's great. Isn't it? Yeah. All right. Um, I think, I think we're probably ready to, to move on to uh, finance, and uh, that would be the next section, section four. Um, Travis, do you want to jump in on the, on the yeah, wish list? I can bear, I can switch look, here? Yeah, just for a second. Um, just real quickly here, we've um, obviously seen this format before, and um, Mr. Hahn and I will work after this meeting to pare it down and, and put it in front of you in the March planning session. Um, but we look at it uh, two different ways when we collect the, the uh, wish lists uh, from the various buildings and departments. Uh, you know, we organize it by school building as well as department. But the main uh, thing, the main reason we go through this exercise is down here at the bottom where we have six really different uh, funding sources that uh, are going to be able to, to be needed to fund uh, all of these expenditures. The first two are... Uh, just pretty easy, pretty, quite frankly. 
the supplies and the curriculum. Uh, you can kind of look through here and pick through um, what we deem has a supply, anything under a thousand here for maintenance. Uh, some of the smaller curricular purchases from the from the various buildings, and I, I feel comfortable, and I, I think Mr. Hahn agrees that we can cover all of those little requests, uh, basically from our forecast. So this is the total from the wish list. This is what's actually in the forecast and the general fund. So it's pretty close. The same way with the purchase services, we're really only looking at three. What I would call a purchase service. We had already planned on the moving cost into the new building. Um, the uh, the the math coaching at the intermediate we might take a look at but uh, and also the continual uh, the continuation of the BCHS leadership that we, uh, we had already started so again I feel comfortable with those two areas we didn't, we already talked about personnel we've got the two custodial positions in there obviously the amount of requests exceed that so we'd have to look at that if we were going to go above that the other three areas are really what this list comes down to and really what um, Obviously, we'll take input, but certainly um, we will work together down to, uh, cl as close to the forecast as possible. The first, uh, the general fund, you know, we look at things such as uh, some of the smaller technology purchases, uh, some of the maintenance purchases, um, the, uh, where are we at here, the choir risers, the instruments, things are, are more for the buildings for instructional purposes, uh, adding a camera to the middle school uh, for safety purposes. Um, that would fit within what's again within the current forecast. The permanent improvement fund again normally about three hundred fifty thousand a year. That is artificially inflated. This yeah. Due to every year we have a request and we know we need it, but we have a request for a bus compound, a bus location to oh. store all the buses. <laughs> what is that? And um, I finally had uh, I finally went out and was able to get a, an estimate um, from Shore and from uh, Sands Decker on site work and I mean they're including like storm sewer connections uh, here in a central location at our elementary school kind of behind it and I'll be honest it's 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 just not doable right now Tony thinks we could cut that cost down quite a bit to maybe half but it's still it's still huge but I wanted to actually put that on there because I wanted you to see that this is a request we're trying to be transparent let you know what we feel and what we get from you know transportation director or somebody like that right but it is you know, I just want to show you, I mean, that, you know, that kind of cost for a, a bus compound, it's just not doable right now. So that really <laughs> bumped that up. Travis just took it out yeah. and you can see the change. There. And that, that brings us back to within being able to do the buses and the new van and some of those transportation expenditures. Yeah. The last thing here, we talked uh, really extensively about the interest money that we think we're going to have available since we don't have to put it back into the project. Um, this is a, a, a tough estimate to make. It's just it's difficult to understand how long you can keep the money in these investments before you have to pay some at construction. So this this could fluctuate. I don't think it'll go any lower, but we actually could. It, you mean because that would raise the interest? We can exactly. The longer we can keep them in we these investments, the right? Okay. Um, you know, the more we might be able to. But these are going to be the big ticket items that, quite frankly, we're not going to be able to do in a normal given year. Um, We've talked about technology. I think, you know, especially technology going into the new building, mm -hmm. I really think we can tie that into the construction fund interest to say, hey, it's not part of the project budget, but we're able to use our interest to get the technology that we need in that new building uh, that wasn't part of the, uh, you know, the specs. The other two areas here, um, the, the equipment that we're going to need for that new building. Again, mm -hmm. additional green space to mow, additional... Uh, asphalt and things to plow. I think we could tie that in uh, to the bond is issue money. The other two uh, items here, I, I don't know how Mr. Hom feels. I don't see us doing the, again, it, it, we're trying to be transparent. Again, we had the request to uh, replace all the ceiling tiles and lights in the high school. With that uh, comes asbestos abatement wow. that really drives up yeah. the cost. And it's just a it's a huge project. I'm, it's just the, not only the cost, but the planning. It, it's the, more one that we've kind of found out that we're better off coming sections of the building. Like, you know, over a couple of years, we do this section, and, and that dollar amount is much more manageable. And then the next year, we, we find another section to do. But to do that, that dollar amount up there is from yeah, a few years ago. Yeah, that, inc that included the first floor, second floor, and the first floor. 
um, down by the office and cafeteria and gym, and that, that's just a big, it's a big ticket item because of the abatement. So I just, again, it, it's, it's a request we get. We wanted to put it on there. We think there are ways we can chip through it, but it's probably not one that we plan to, to move this year. So the last thing, and I agree with you, um, that we, we have talked about and we have made some progress on is replacing the lighting at the stadium. Um, when we first started to look into this, if you recall, we had worked with uh, Musco Lighting that Chad, uh, Mr. Little had worked with, and we were really able to develop a, a good set of spef specifications of what we wanted in terms of 50-foot uh, candle uh, across the field so that nowhere on the uh, field is under 50-foot. Uh, the, the, the candle, uh, the 80-foot poles, the, the safety of the poles, having the controls much lower on the poles so we can access them easier, redoing of the electrical panel. Uh, I won't go through everything, but we've got some good firm pricing through uh, this source well contract, which basically means that this has already been bid through a purchasing co-op, so we would not have to, again, publicly bid it, write new specs, we could, we were already a member of the source well project, so we would just have to have the board approve um, this bid, which is, you can see the amount here, which gets us everything, remote access, being able to turn the lights off, even if you weren't here from an app. And it gets the show. Yeah, <laughs> it does, six, six shows um, that uh, are pre-programmed. But as we move through this, I thought that with a project this big and, and with this many resources, we really needed to get another bid. And we were able to do that, uh, where are we here, right here, uh, again through another source well um, uh, client, general vendor, contractor. Uh, con general contractor. You can see the, and, and it's also good because they give you a little bit of a different perspective in that it's a little bit less, but then their alternate was, they, they said, with the LED, you're not going to access the drivers that much anyway. So we would just put them up high anyway and it, the, you might have to run a crane once every five years as opposed to doing almost all the time now so they didn't see that as being as, as a big a deal um, not having as many of the pre-programmed things they just want us to show this if we did want that it would be additional um, the warranty um, the big difference right there what was the warranty yeah one yeah one is 25 years and includes parts and labor this one um, this one, if we want to go to a 25-year warranty, then you, you got to tack on that dollar amount mm -hmm. to do that. They're offering a one-year labor, and um, what was it on parts? It was 12. 12, 12 years on parts. So big, big difference. But you're saying the other one was must go. Years. Yes. Years. The other one had all this. The thing. other one had the base yeah. bid of specs that we wanted. Gotcha. Um, again, they I had a conference with them, and they said actually the. The higher up you go, the worse the light is. So they recommended 60 foot poles. I don't know enough about it to be able to, you know what I mean? You kind of like, so they're saying we should stick with 60 foot poles, but if not, we would have to add another. So again, I think it was a good exercise in getting another look at it, uh, a second opinion. Um, as you can tell, we put a, put a little bit of legwork in it. So unless we hear differently from the board tonight or within the next few weeks, even at the March 8th meeting, our plan is, and I disagree if, if I'm saying something out of turn here, but to continue to move forward with this, tie up some loose ends with exactly what specs uh, we want, to get working with Mr. Little and our electricians as well, so, and then bring a recommendation to you at the April board meeting. We, we just feel like, <clears throat> with the interest money, a big ticket item that costs this amount these lights are 39 years old right yeah. now. They're very inefficient. We're using them way more than they were used in 1982. You had football on Friday nights. Now, now they're used all the time. We have practice out there for everything because we, we don't have all the green space that we used to have. So these things are used all the time. We can, you know, it, it takes a while, but the return will come back to the district. And um, they, if we don't do it now, I can't tell you in the next 10 years we're going to have that we'll amount of money, money to yeah. do it. So, um, we, we said they do it during the summer. Yeah, be ready. Good question. And one yeah. reason why Travis mentioned March that we might bring that ticket alone back to you is because we got to get the we, it's six to eight weeks on ordering this and getting it here, and then you got June and early July to get it done. 
and you've got to get us on the schedule to do it. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of our plan. I um, don't want to spend too much time on it, but, you know, right. some of those big ticket items, I think it fits within. So you're going to pare down that 72? Yeah, we're going to pare, we're going to pare down the, and bring it back at the March planning session. Okay. Um, we just wanted to make sure that, with the, especially with the lighting project, I think we're good on the, the technology here, again, using the bond issue money that mm -hmm. really the, the approval would come. I mean, you, you'll approve this entire list once we get it pared down, but then separately approve if, if we get to a point where we're, we're comfortable moving forward, the project to replace the stadium lighting. So that'll be our next step. Not bad. Normally, I feel like that number is a lot bigger. A lot. We've got, and we've got this. That you guys are look, looking you're, to you're whittling down, down the 72. The, the 72 on the far right. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's right. Yeah, no. I this is 300,000. I think we can. This extra 850,000 helps from the. Yeah. Well, yeah. Even taking out the. Helps. Yeah. 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 I, I think we can definitely get that it, well under what he has budgeted in some areas. Not everything will be recommended, but there's some things we, we need to do here. Right. Um, Absolutely. Really. Okay, I thought that's it for the. Yeah, that's right. it for section four. All right, so uh, let's move on to section five, the COVID updates. Um, it's page twenty-five. Uh, just want you guys to, to remember, um, you know, we we have communicated with our parents and with the community. The educator vaccination schedule was not made by the school district. It was made by the Fairfield Department of Health and Fairfield Medical Center, who is the entity on behalf of Fairfield Department of Health administering shots two educators as part of Ohio's educator vaccination program that Governor DeWine has prioritized. Um, our first dose is tomorrow. Our students are receiving remote assignments. The K-4 did receive paper copies. All their assignments are posted on our website as well. Um, under our academics tab and the link was sent out to parents this evening. It's also been on social media and in other district communications that I've sent out over the last week or week and a half or two weeks. Our second dose um, will be on March 18th, and typically with the second dose, there are some reactions sometimes for certain people. Um, rather than scrambling on a Friday morning um, and having multiple routes canceled and multiple classrooms uncovered and then having to cancel, uh, we just felt like uh, giving that time on Thursday and Friday, Thursday to get the shots, Friday to get everybody healthy and get back here on Monday. That was the best way to go. So, um, again, you can see the schedule and uh, Boone Carroll. We have about 173 educators. Uh, really, between 10:30 and 12:30 tomorrow, uh, we should be done with our first shot. And um, you know, that's about 83% of our staff. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll do this again uh, in 21 days on March March 18th. So. Uh, right now, COVID cases across the, the state, you know, I can show you all the numbers. Um, the daily number of cases is coming way down across the state. The county is sitting at 687 active cases. That's 0.4% of the population that has active cases. There's 157,000 people in the county, according to the 2010 census. So right now, I, I was telling uh, Mr. Johnson before the board meeting, uh, it feels very strange. I have gone over a week without sending a notice. We haven't had any new cases. Um, we are down to zero active cases in our school district. No staff, no students currently infected that I have been made aware of or that a parent has notified the district of. So yeah, it'll happen. We're gonna have a few more, certainly more. But um, right now things are headed in the right direction. So I would love to see you know, things continue. The state, the nation, everybody get back to normal our kids need it but I want to commend the board you guys it wasn't easy you know uh, a lot of people supported us but it was definitely a limb to go out on but looking back at this point um, you know our kids needed us and we, we, we've been there for them and our families needed us so uh, we've also been as safe as we can and I just think you guys have done a great job and it was has not been easy but uh, and it won't be easy but you know you guys have done a great job and keep students interest first uh, and always and balance that with the other things and I think we'll be okay so I think we're all right but that's that's again an hour and a half meeting I'm sorry but this is typically our busiest meeting in terms of laying it all out there for the upcoming year 
but as Travis said, we'll refine some things, bring it back in March, get final input. That list of things will get approved in April typically. There are maybe a few things that we need to get started on, as Travis mentioned, that we may do in March. Um, but overall, I wanted you to kind of understand where we are, and if you guys have concerns, you know, now's a great time to bring them up or call us and let us know, you know, if you have an individual opinion that you'd like to see, and, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can. But uh, if we're not headed in the right direction, let us know. Let us know. Well, thank you. No good. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, Very thorough. Thank you. All right. Item F. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Sherman. Jimmy, Jimmy Mr. Jimmy Gallagher. Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Sherman. Uh, yes. Mr. Jimmy Johnson. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes.